America's sixth largest city, 12th largest metropolitan area, home of more than a million and a half people, site of the nation's biggest steel rolling plant, home to the House of McCormick, this country's biggest tea and spice house, America's second seaport, this is Baltimore. Meanwhile, Maryland Governor Larry Hogan has signed an executive order declaring a state of emergency in Baltimore, activating the National Guard. Supplies are being sent to areas throughout the city, including 20,000 meals and 1,000 bottles of water, which will be provided to law enforcement and first responders. Now, Prince George's police deployed 30 to 35 officers to Baltimore to help with the riots. Hogan says that they're working to help local businesses recover. He's brass! Photographer! He's a photographer! He's a Baltimore is a city in Maryland situated on the water and has played a key role in the history of the United States for being an important seaport. With the site and situation of the city followed the inhabitants. With inhabitants, then came development. With the development, the city naturally divided into different sectors, such as areas designated for exclusively industry, entertainment, and living. Some parts of the city, of course, are better than others, but is it being done in a natural way? Baltimore is a city with a very rich history in this development, from a booming seaport with massive influx of immigration, goods, and services to rapid decline, which ultimately resulted in an unrecognizable city from what it was once known. Places that used to be full of life are now stricken with vacancy, crime, and poverty in the large pockets. By analyzing the restructuring period of Baltimore in the 1960s, specifically with the Mount Royal Fremont Project, we will witness how this shift began. We will end our journey with an analysis of the East Baltimore area and what has occurred recently in the Baltimore area. The Baltimore Urban Renewal and Housing Agency was developed in 1956 by the, at time year, Theodore R. McKeldin. McKeldin believed that the Reed Development Commission did not need to be an independent sector, so he decided to combine the role of this group with the roles of city planning, as well as health and welfare departments to create one singular agency whom had a common goal to essentially redevelop troubled areas of Baltimore. The Baltimore Urban Redevelopment and Housing Agency, also known as BURA, became responsible for the clearance, redevelopment, and relocation for large amounts of Baltimore, including the Ro Mount Royal Fremont area. Part of the role of the BURA was to go through various areas in Baltimore in order to survey the area and see what the conditions of specific areas were and whether or not the area should stay as is, be, rede be redeveloped, or be completely cleared and rebuilt. In a project plan submitted by Burra to the mayor, they described the Mount Royal Fremont area as hopeful if dealt with in the necessary way. The initial proposal called for the 7th Street by 7th Street area to be completely eliminated and rebuilt from the ground up in order to properly rebuild and redevelop the area, not only to be a residential area, but also so that small businesses and public areas can be placed in there as well. The plan was ultimately approved a year later in 1961 after a few revisions. One of the main changes was that instead of a complete rebuilding plan, the project would be a partial teardown, where the rest would just be remodeling and renewal. Along with this, the living areas were reconstruction. Originally, the layout of the neighborhood was all the same, with the majority of the living complexes being medium density housing. The new project plan proposed for various levels of living with various types of living arrangements being separated by office buildings and stores. In the wake of the redevelopment of Mount Royal Fremont, thousands were without ho housing. Baltimore claimed the high-density housing for public space, 
which ultimately eliminated the opportunity for housing for thousands of people. When the majority of those who were relocated would end up in the newly redeveloped public housing facilities. But even then, these areas were not only overcrowded, but also only had a certain amount of space per facility. Another significant detail that added to the severity of the wake that occurred after the Mount Royal Fremont project was that this was only one of many projects that occurred between 1950 and 1964. In a study by Christopher Boone, it can be estimated that about 25,000 Baltimore citizens were displaced as a re result of the redevelopment and the condemning of certain housing facilities. Along with this, it is estimated that about 90% of those who were relocated were African American. In the case of Mount Re Royal Fremont Redevelopment Project, it can be seen that the majority of people occupying the spaces that were claimed by the city were African American. This can be seen as a deliberate act to move this minority po population elsewhere. The relocation process did exist and oftentimes people did have the opportunity to live elsewhere. But the main issue was that the areas that they were now being moved to had a much higher rent. The landlords of the new areas called it an economic rent, but in reality, it was a deliberate way to keep the minority population out of occupying the new area as well. The only option for this population was to move into public housing which could now have been a reasonable option, but out of the 17,000 housing units that were available in the 1970s, there were now 40,000 requests for public housing. The city had not only isolated the group, but had also forced them to figure out how they would be able to live somewhere else and afford it as it became unrealistic that they would be able to acquire the limited public space that was being offered. This was not only seen as forced homelessness amongst a larger population, but also successfully created segregation in the living communities. With any city, the decline has a plethora of reasons as to why it occurred, but in the case of Baltimore, it is safe to say that a major reason is that it was centered around its previous housing and development practices of redlining, deliberately done and natural by any means. The effects are still being seen to this day. Some areas are impacted more than others. We specifically focused on the East Baltimore and the Mount Carmel neighborhoods, both of which are currently undergoing a complete 360 in its urban renewal. One of the many pressing problems that urban renewal tackles in the East Baltimore in particular is the vacant space, whether it is of houses, warehouses, or retail spaces. Large sections of once lively streets and neighborhoods are now desolate and unkempt. Imagine playing outside of your house as a seven-year-old only to face the other homes that were busted out with windows and boarded up entries. Not a childhood I'm, that I'm sure many of us here at Miami would be able to relate to. The East Baltimore Revitalization Initiative, a large-scale innovative effort to transform a deeply distressed 88-acre area adjacent to the Johns Hopkins Hospital complex and a mixed-income residential community and engine of economic opportunity for both long-time and new residents. The residents of this area have the second lowest median household incomes in Baltimore City, and only half of those working age are considered to be in the workforce, being either employed or looking to work. A nonprofit entity, East Baltimore Development Incorporated, was established to manage the 20 year project. EBDI is governed by a board that includes representatives from the community, the Ann E. Casey Foundation, the Johns Hopkins Institutions, the City of Baltimore, the State of Maryland, and local and national philanthropies. 
the entire project has an estimated cost of $1.8 billion. From the early stages of the project, the community has played an important role in setting goals and creating procedures for the project, including establishing a system to encourage economic inclusion and local hiring. In response to the community's concerns, the project's key goals include a commitment to economic inclusion to ensure that the benefits of the project are shared with minority and women-owned businesses and local minority and women residents. Plans call for construction of roughly 2,200 new and rehabilitated environmentally friendly homes for buyers and renters with a range of incomes. Research and other commercial space, a model community school, and an early childhood center, retail establishments, and new recreational spaces. Economic inclusion is central to the fundamental purpose of the East Baltimore redevelopment, which is to repair and enhance both physical and human capital. As the project has progressed, it was clear that the linking economic inclusion to strengthen the workforce development efforts was critical. The bottom line is that the right commitment and policies can ensure that development projects are about more than just physical improvements. They can also strengthen local businesses, provide new opportunities for job seekers, and build the economy of often struggling communities.